ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وسلم uh, all praises due to allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Again, uh, back to Surah Al-Rahman. We said the general frame of the surah is, who can remind us? The, is what? The mercy. The mercy. Okay. And we said the whole surah is about this general theme, about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The surah is meant to take us into a deeper meaning of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of relating to the concept of Allah's mercy on a superficial level the surah teaches us or takes us on a journey and it helps us appreciate the manifestations of Allah's mercy sometimes yes we are aware of Allah's mercy and we are aware of the blessings but we haven't made that connection so the surah puts everything within that context and it brings everything together. So we start to see that all the blessings that we enjoy are not taken for granted. They were brought to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created them for us. It's not that He created them and then he, it, they happened to come to us. No, they, Allah created them specifically for us. And it shows the depth and breadth of Allah's mercy the intensity of that mercy, the beauty of it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes special care of humans. So all these things should be, and it's, it's put in, in, in man's nature to usually be thankful. If someone smiles at you, naturally, naturally you tend to return back that smile. If someone does you a favor, if you have not been culturally conditioned not to respond in the same way, naturally you would respond with another favor. You would return that favor. It's, na it's natural. And by the way, they use this in marketing. A lot of the shops or sales points, when you walk in, they offer you some kind of uh, sweets, sometimes a cup of tea, some coffee. And you might think this is complimentary. Oh, it's so innocent, but it's not. It's psychology. They give it to you, and sometimes they start showing you. You know, so you walk into some shops, especially cl clothes, and this is very common in the Middle East. They start showing you everything they have, and they get it off the shelf, and they untie it, and they unpackage it, and they open it in, in front of you, and they give you special care. And you might feel a bit flattered, thinking, oh, they're, speci they're taking special care of you. But that's psychology because you find yourself compelled. You know, this man has, you know, put himself in, himself in pain to show me all these things. And he got out of his way and he unpackaged all this stuff. It's a lot of work to put it back to get in his place. So you find yourself compelled to buy even if it's something little. It's all psychology. So don't think... Somebody might be so innocent, yeah, they, li they, li they like to be nice to their customers, but most of the time it is about manipulation. But th because they are taking advantage or exploiting this human nature. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows He created us in that way to be thankful to Him. So He is putting everything in context for us, so we find ourselves, our human nature, taking us towards thankfulness without having to put yourself into that pain or get out of your way and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should be nature should, or it should be natural. If we understand, if we understand the reality of this life and we understand if, where everything came from, it should be natural, it should flow naturally that we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's the conditioning that we go through 
in our environment, our upbringing, our culture, our education, all of this puts us or creates the wrong context where we don't appreciate what Allah subhanahu what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So we don't naturally tend to be thankful. People to, tend to be ungrateful. We reached the point where we where the, uh, the surah talks about the two seas. And we said this is one of the miracles of the Quran to talk about this. 1400 years ago when humans just recently discovered that natural phenomenon. Uh, and we said that the fact that there are seas or bodies of water where the salinity is very high and you have sweet, fresh rivers and lakes and each one of them has its own functions, has its own uh, uh, products, distinct products. And all of this, it adds variety to human life. All of this is, is obviously flows from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah, again, puts the same word to humans and jinn. Which of the favors of Allah would you deny? And as I said, sometimes Allah sends the same message from different angles or in different ways. And this is something that is... I would say somehow clear in the Sharia because people have different mental orientations, different backgrounds, different uh, mental processes. So Allah appeals to all of those. For example, Islam, what does Islam mean? What does religion mean? You will find this in so many ways, introduced so many ways in the Quran. For example, the famous hadith of Jibreel السلام, when he came to the Prophet in the form of a stranger man and he came and asked the Prophet about Islam, Iman, Ihsan and the signs of the hereafter. The Prophet gave him the answer what Islam was and what Iman was and what Ihsan was. This is one example. There's another, another hadith where the Prophet says I was sent, the summary of the mission of the Prophet was put in this hadith. I was sent to perfect character and good manners. So it's a way to introduce Islam. If you were to, someone was to ask you about Islam, you could tell them it's the perfection of manners. That's all what Islam is. Another hadith reported by Muslim, the hadith of uh, Tamim al-Dari, where the Prophet ﷺ said, الدين النصيحة Deen, or the religion of Islam is nasiha. Now this word is comprehensive. It's not, it doesn't talk about one aspect of Islam. No, that's all what Islam is about, nasiha. That's all what Islam is about. Let me take uh, a digression here. How is the word nasiha usually translated? Advice. advice, yes? And usually the hadith is translated, the deen, the religion is advice. <coughs> And that's the problem with translations. Yesterday I talked about this point briefly. That's the problem with translations. Let's read the hadith based on that common translation. The religion is advice. So the companions asked to who? The Prophet ﷺ said to Allah and his book and his messenger and the Muslims, the leaders or their authorities and their laymen. Does it make sense? Give nasiha to Allah. Can you give nasiha to Allah? Advice? Can you give advice to Allah? Can you give advice to the Quran, the book of Allah? Can you give advice to the Prophet So that's a problem with uh, advice here. It doesn't cover the, the depth of Islam. So what is the word? In some translations they use sincerity, but that's still a deficient one. Nasiha is a way of life, very comprehensive word and extremely powerful. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said the deen is nasiha. So it summarizes Islam. The word nasiha covers Islam. So you see the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, they're referring to Islam in many different ways. So if one, one explanation, one definition doesn't hit you, the other one will. So as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appeals to different uh, understandings, different dispositions. 
because that's that's part of Allah's mercy. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeating the same verse, the same verse. Which of the signs or which of the favors of Allah, of your Lord, do you deny? So if in one context you can't relate to this, probably in another context you will be able. And Allah repeats it. So even it might sometimes maybe leave a small impact in your heart. But you hear it the second time in a different context, it takes that to a higher level. And it builds on, builds on until it reaches a level where you all of a sudden you wake up. Sometimes you receive the same advice for years and it doesn't make that much difference. And one day it hits you. How often that we, there is something that we know, but when one day, because we went through some experience, we heard the same statement again and it is as if we heard it for the first time. That was the case with the companions of the Prophet ﷺ when he ﷺ passed away. We know the famous story when Umar al-Khattab stood up and he said, anyone who says Muhammad has died, then I'm going to chop off his head. Abu Bakr عنه, was outside of Medina and the outskirts of Medina, so he came to the Prophet ﷺ. He entered into the house and he looked at the Prophet ﷺ and he kissed him between his eyes and he said, how good you are, alive and dead. And then he went out to the people and everyone was there. And Abu, Abu Bakr said to Umar, sit down. Abu Umar, uh, Umar al-Khattab was still speaking and threatening people. Abu Bakr told him, sit down. And Umar won't listen. Sit down. He won't listen. Sit down. He won't listen. He ignored him. And he started speaking himself. People ignored Umar and they came to Abu Bakr. Because they were trying to make sense of what was happening. And Umar al-Khattab was making it at that stage more complicated for them. So they all turned to Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, And Abu Bakr told them simply whoever worships Muhammad, Muhammad has died. And whoever worships Allah, then Allah never dies. Then he recited the verse, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ سورة آل عمران And Muhammad is only a man from amongst yourselves. And he's a messenger, from one of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if he gets killed or if he passes away, are you going to turn back on your heels? The companions, Umar al-Khattab specifically said, Wallahi, it is as if I hear, I've heard this for the first time. But he's familiar with the verse because it was revealed during the Battle of Uhud about eight years ago. Eight years before that incident. So they were familiar with it. But Umar al-Khattab says, Wallahi, it is as if I've heard this verse for the first time. Why? Because the context took his comprehension to a different level now and now he could relate to it. The same happens with the repetition of this verse. I said repetition is a secret when it comes to human behavior. You can't reach a good level of skill without repetition. You want to learn language, you need repetition. You want to learn physical sport, you need repetition. You need to get good at even any, any, any kind of skill with repetition. Repetition is the, is the answer. And it's the secret of knowledge. The secret of knowledge. I know a few people who have no clue don't have, they don't have a specific date when they memorize the Qur'an. If you ask them when, at what age you memorize the Qur'an, they tell you, I don't know. Why? Because they, these are people who would recite the Qur'an every four or five days. They would finish it every four or five days. And they just found, one day they found the Qur'an in their heads. <laughs> they didn't, okay, memorize it, it's a traditional way. A lot of the scholars, that's how they relate the way they, they, they memorize the Qur'an. If you check with the great scholars, you will find that the way they got this knowledge and the deep understanding and the memory, phenomenal memory, is through repetition. They would read the same thing over and over again. There was one of the great scholars... I can't remember his name now, but he, before he gave a halaqa or a class, he would repeat it to himself 50 times. 50 times before he would go and deliver the, uh, the halaqa. His mother, his old mother, told him, you know, why do you do this to yourself? 
after the, the fifth time, the tenth time, I've memorized your class, your halaqa. So why do you repeat it 50 times? He said, I'll give you the answer later. So he would come to his mother like two months later and he would say, remember that class that I gave? She'd say, yes, I remember that. He said, can you tell me anything about it? She would say, I forgot. He said, that's what I repeated 50 times. I can mention it or I can deliver it back again exactly as I did two months ago. You see, that's repetition. Repetition is the mother of skill. Okay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talk about another phenomenon. One of the signs of the mercy of Allah. And there is some point here, beautiful point. Sometimes humans get proud about themselves because of something they discovered or something they have developed. For example, all the technology that we have. All the technology that we have. People would say, okay, you know, we made that. We invented that. It wasn't there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds humans that even this is Allah's mercy. So he says, And these great massive ships that sail through the sea, they belong to Allah. And they are originally from Allah. People have this arrogance that we made them, we invented them, we engineered them, we put them together. Okay, so that's our invention. You don't realize that the argument of subhanAllah, I, don't want, I want to choose my words wisely. Sometimes you deal with someone very intelligent and they are two, three steps ahead of you. So you play a game and you find out they're already, they're already prepared for that and they have even set you up down the road. So you can't play with them. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people, Allah knows because Allah knows what's going to happen. He knows what kind of arrogance people are going to have. He knows how people are going to feel proud about themselves that we have invented that, we made that. Okay. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one who created the raw materials for us. He is the one who made life possible. He made everything easy for us. And He created us and He created our intelligence. So where are you going? You're trying to attribute things to yourselves, but it's from Allah. Everything you've used to put this thing together is, Allah subhanahu, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He even inspired you to come up with that invention. He's the one who inspired you to come up with this invention. There's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَالِقُ كُلِّ صَانِعٍ وَصَنْعَتِهِ such a profound hadith that clears the doubts. The Prophet ﷺ says, In Allah, indeed, Allah, Khaliqu Kulli Sani. Allah is indeed is the creator of every craftsman, of every manufacturer, and whatever he makes. So we make cars and we think it's our own intelligence. Where where did this intelligence come from? How did you make it? Raw materials, where did you get them from? They're from Allah. Everything, the technology, where did it come from? Allah inspired you with that. Allah caused you to grow in terms of knowledge so that you reach that point and you put all of these things together. And all of this is still insignificant compared to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is putting another, another example. After mentioning this, that these great massive ships that sail through the sea for your own benefit, they belong to Allah and they are from Allah and they are a gift from Allah. So again, which of the favors of Allah, of your Lord, do you deny? So it's not your own favor. It's not your own favor, it's Allah's. So are you going to be thankful? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Okay, which number this verse is? Oh, just before that, before the ships, something about the seas, Allah mentioned that يَخْرُجُ مِنْهُمَ اللُّؤْلُؤُ وَالْمَرْجَانِ That from uh, the, the, the sea, 
emerge pearl and coral, all these precious things, unexpectedly, you get them from the sea. All these hidden treasures. Who would predict that something like that could come out from the depths of the sea, of the ocean? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it there and He placed it there for you. And there's a lesson behind that. Okay, so this was number uh, 22. And the uh, verse number 24 talks about the ships. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you fall into this arrogance, just generally, I'm, trying, I'm creating a context. If you think oh, you, all of these or oh, the ships are your own uh, product, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately says, Kullu man alayha fan. Everyone on this earth, everyone shall perish. So if you insist on that, in that state of arrogance, and that this doesn't convince you, you don't see the truth, then death is the ultimate reality. De death is what's going, is going to shake your heart deep inside. Everyone shall die. Can you challenge this fact? This is a fact you cannot challenge. And that's, by, by the way, similar to the argument Ibrahim السلام, used against an namrud against the king. Because in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ibrahim challenged an namrud he gave him da'wah, and Namrud challenged him. So Ibrahim said, قَالَ, قال رَبِّيَ اللي, uh, uh, قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ Ibrahim said, My Lord brings, because that man, that king, ascribed lordship to himself, that he was the Lord, he was the Rabb of the universe. He was the Ilah, the God of the people. So Ibrahim challenged him and he said to him, Rabbi alladhi yuhi wa yumeet. My Lord is the one who gives life and brings about death, takes it away. What did the man say? He said, I give life and death. He was playing a semantic game. Basically what he said, this is a man who was destined to death, sentenced to death. I forgive him. So I brought, I gave him life. And that's a man who did nothing. I could just kill him. So I brought death. So it was a semantic game. Ibrahim knew he had to take the argument to a different level. So what did Ibrahim say? He said, okay, I'll give you something you can't play with now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the sun to rise from the east. You cause it to rise from the west. Okay, now he can't play a semantic game there. It's a clear argument. By the way, they teach this in this, uh, some of the scholars, early scholars of Muslims, they would teach this as one <coughs> style of argument. And they, subhanAllah, they get so many benefits from this small argument that Ibrahim alayhi salam had. And this is, there's something here similar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that even these ships that you think that you created, that you made, and this makes you arrogant, they belong to Allah and they came in the first place from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if in case someone still does not believe, Allah, believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, everyone is going to die except for Allah. Now this is something you can't argue with because you're going to die and you can't prove that people will not die or someone will not die because you, you can't get anyone now who is 150 years old. People are dead and you know that. No one has survived since a thousand years ago until and he still lives today. <coughs> so this is a fact people cannot argue with. So you see Allah subhanahu is appealing to different mindsets. Everyone is going to die. The scholars say it's not only the creation or creatures on the earth. All creatures will die. Just prior to the day of judgment or the early stages of the day of judgment, every, every creature will die and will, there will remain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Even the angels will die. The angels themselves will die and there will only remain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would say, Ana al Malik, I am the king of kings. And no one but Allah there. Everything is dead. Everyone is dead, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now, what is the beauty that we find in this verse? A beautiful thing that has to do a lot with Islam. And I know many people have a problem with... Sometimes people come to you, they say, if Allah is merciful, why does He punish people? Why does He put people in the hellfire? <laughs> if Allah is merciful, why does He allow suffering? And people might come as well and say, if Allah is capable of everything, can he do this? Something which is not befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not suitable for the majesty of Allah. Where do the, all of those people go wrong? They take a single attribute of Allah or a single name in isolation. It doesn't work like that. You need and that's the beauty of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who studied the rules that pertain to the names and attributes of Allah, they know this. You need to understand them individually, but to understand them fully, you need to bring them together. You need to bring them together. So for someone to sin and say Allah is merciful, no, you got it wrong. Yes, Allah is merciful, but you can't take that in isolation. You can't take it out of its context. Allah is merciful and Allah is severe in punishment. Know that Allah is very severe and powerful in His punishment and Allah is merciful and forgiving. That's how we relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you relate to Allah through only one of His names and you take it in a state of isolation, you would misinterpret and you would have the wrong notions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I will share with you a profound principle. Get ready. <laughs> I won't be able to explain it in full, in full, but it's going to act, it will instigate your thought process. It's, it's like a, a, a chain reaction. It will help you think. And I think people don't need to learn a lot of information more than they need to jumpstart their brains. Just initiate the process of thinking about things right. If you get that, it's just like the, the, the Chinese proverb. I mean, if someone comes to you poor and you're a fisherman, you can give him a fish every day, but better teach him how to fish. That's the same thing. If you can, if you can start this approach with the Qur'an, you're always thinking about the Qur'an, you're thinking about what does, what does that mean, how does it relate to my life, how can I benefit from this, I will be very happy. Because even if you spend hundreds of hours every month learning and learning and learning, with the lifestyle that we have, you would tend to forget. More important than acquiring new knowledge, we need to synthesize this knowledge, we need to digest it. And find this personal connection with it it becomes more beneficial and then it becomes easier for you to learn more information it becomes much easier for you because you will be doing it for the right reason with the right intention everything we do wrong everything a human being does and it's wrong the reason for that if you dig deep, they have the wrong notion about Allah at that moment. Anything you do, and you do it wrong, or you do something evil, something unacceptable, something haram, if you dig deep, you'll find the source of this is that you have a wrong notion about Allah. There's nothing in this world such as positive thinking, negative thinking. We Muslims use it, I sometimes use it, but that's because we are influenced by the secular approach to life. Life is about Allah. Allah is the center of our lives. Anything goes wrong, you can trace it back to the center. When, you, when someone is very, being very pessimistic, we say, oh, you know, you, you're, you're being negative. You need to think positively. That's all semantics, by the way. It's all semantics. Or what it is, when someone, or when we say, oh, you know, you're thinking negatively, do you know what it is? You're having a wrong thought about Allah. That's it. 
That's a principal concept. I'll give examples and it will be clearer, inshallah. Okay. When a Muslim, let me start with a Muslim. When a Muslim commits zina, the moment, moment he falls into that sin or he commits theft, he steals something. The moment he is perpetrating that sin, what do you think his notion about Allah is? That Allah sees him or not? Is he aware that Allah is watching him at that moment he's doing it? When someone is falling into zina, he's doing it now. Do you think he is aware that Allah is watching him? Huh? If you think about Allah at the moment of sin, you can't. <laughs> if you truly think about it, it's not just a passing thought, no. If you're truly aware of Allah, what is his notion about Allah? Allah doesn't see me. Allah doesn't see me. That's why he has the guts to do it. And that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. That a person does not, a Muslim cannot, a believer cannot commit zina or does not commit zina except that his iman is lifted. His awareness of Allah, his belief in Allah is lifted as, and it's as, as a cloud, it becomes as a cloud. I'm putting two narrations together just to get the meaning across. A cloud above his head. Until he's done and he's back, he comes back to reality, then his iman goes back into his heart. So that person committed zina because at that very moment he had the wrong notion about Allah, Allah doesn't see me. When someone commits suicide, what do you think their notion about Allah is at that time? They might not, you know, say it exactly about Allah, but they might, they, they're just thinking, oh, life is, is tough and I can't put up with it anymore. Basically what he's saying, the deeper meaning is Allah hasn't been good with me. Allah has been harsh with me. And life is not worth living. I want to escape from that. Basically he's saying Allah is not merciful. What is the notion? Let me take it a step further. No one enters the hellfire. There's no one who enters the hellfire except because they had the wrong notion about Allah. And that's exactly what Allah says to the people of the fire. In Surah Fussilat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimands the people in the hellfire and He says, وَلَكِنْ ظَنَنْتُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَعْلَمُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Because their skin will speak, their, their, their hands will speak, their eyes will speak and tell on them the sins they committed. And they were trying to deny it. And Allah would say, and you thought, that's because you thought Allah does not know much of what you do. It is these wrong thoughts and notions about Allah that has brought you to destruction. Anyone enters paradise, it enters the hellfire, it's because they had the wrong notions about Allah. So you can't do anything wrong without having the wrong notion about Allah. What we claim to be negative thinking is not negative thinking, is having the wrong suspicion about Allah. And what we call positive thought is ultimately having good thoughts about Allah. That's all what it is. Is it clear or needs more clarification? If you can walk away with, with, with this benefit from Surah Al-Rahman, it's enough. But as I said, it's a chain reaction. You just had this, the first reaction. <laughs> Hopefully it will explode in your head some, some, somewhere. There's no positives. There's nothing. It's, it's all, you know, sometimes language is a game. We give things name, but it's not, it's not the right way to describe it. But that's the influence of culture, that's the influence of wrong philosophies and outlooks on life. We think by means of our language, our language describes our thought process. So now, when we say positive thinking, negative thinking, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. 
that's some sort of euphemism. You know, euphemism. We say something which sounds good, yeah, or sounds neutral, but there's a more serious reality behind it. That's what it is. When what we describe as positive thinking is actually having the right and the good thoughts about Allah. And when you have negative thinking, you're basically having the wrong notions about Allah. That's it. Because life, life does not stand by itself. Life does not stand by itself. Things don't happen randomly. Allah causes them to happen. So if you say, oh, you know, I think, you know, if, that's a common thing. Everything I do, it just falls apart. If there's a successful project, if I get involved, it will be, it will fail. That's it, you know, everything I do just happens to, to fail. It happens to fall apart. We say that innocently. And if someone was to give you advice, they would usually say, oh, you're thinking that you're being negative, you're having negative thoughts. No, no, but basically, look at what you, see, what, what you are saying. You're just saying, Allah is working against me. That's exactly what you're saying. But you don't have the courage to say it. So we, you know, we seek means around it. We say, we say it indirectly. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to succeed. So wherever you go, Allah puts hurdles on your way. So we say being negative. No, you're having the wrong thoughts about Allah. As simple as that. So that's why Iman empowers you. When you understand the names and attributes of Allah well, names and attributes of Allah, understand them well, comprehend them, live by their meanings, you will always be, or most of the time, you will be in what people call positive thinking. When you have the wrong notions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what people call negative thinking, you're just basically having something wrong, wrong knowledge about Allah. Shaitan pumps into that. That's what shaitan does. That's what shaitan does. Look at the story of Adam alayhi salam. Allah told him and his wife Eve, you know, be in paradise, enjoy yourselves, everything you want is there, the best of what you can think of, or even better than that. Except for this tree, don't come near it. He doesn't need anything more than that. It's even beyond his needs. Shaitan, what did Shaitan say to him? He didn't say Allah is bad or Allah doesn't want good for you. He brought it tacitly. He said, shall I not show you the tree that will make you live forever and will give you ultimate authority and power and resources? That's all what he said to him. What was he alluding to? He was basically saying to him, Allah did not give you everything. He gave you this stuff, but he deprived you or prevented you from the best thing. So negative thoughts. And that's why Adam fell into that. And this is why he needed to ask Allah to forgive him. So every time you sin or you fall into sin, don't think so much just about that sin. Oh, I should avoid it. Yes, you should avoid it. But work deeper. It becomes easier for you to leave it. You have sinned because you had the wrong notion about Allah. So fix that, the sin will be fixed. Getting there? Getting there? Who still has a problem? I'll explain it more. I, I, I just want, if, if you get this point, I'll be happy. Hmm? Huh? Clear? Yeah. Clear? Okay. If it's clear, give me examples. You stuck. You stuck with me. <laughs> Who can give me an example? A story you heard, something from the seerah, something you, from your personal life, a scenario you can just invent now. And by the way, what they call positive thinking works. Positive thinking works. Do you know why? Because it's not positive thinking. It's applying a hadith, a divine hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's a divine hadith where the Messenger of Allah narrates from Allah that he says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi, falyadhunna abdi bi ma sha. You know, life is yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this hadith, <coughs> this statement he says, I am to my servant as he thinks of me. So let my servant have whatever thoughts he wants about me. He wants about me. You choose how Allah deals with you. You develop the right thoughts about Allah. <coughs> Okay? Then Allah will make these things, Allah will make it a reality. You have the negative thoughts about Allah, 
okay, it's gonna fall apart, things won't work, it won't work, and it will fall apart. Because that's your choice. You just, you just said it, but indirectly, that Allah puts hurdles my way. So let's fix our language. It's important because you change your language, you change your thinking, you change your heart. There's no positive, negative thinking. It's all how you think about Allah. That's all because Allah is the source of all these things. Allah SWT says, قُلْ كُلٌّ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ سورة النساء فما لها أولاء القوم لا يكادون يفقهون حديثا Say to them, you know, everything's from Allah because they used to say to the Prophet ﷺ when something good comes to them, they say that's from Allah because we worship Him, supposedly. And when something bad comes to them, they say, oh, that's a curse because of you, Muhammad. Allah SWT says to him, no, tell them, oh, all is from Allah. Everything happens, it's Allah's creation. Allah causes it to happen. So, whatever you think about Allah, that's how you're going to behave, how this, how, this is how life will turn out to be. That's why Allah, Allah gave you, imagine Allah gave you a choice. How do you want Allah to deal with you? You choose it. You choose it. Spooky, isn't it? <laughs> it shows you how much choice you have. SubhanAllah, in this masjid, the word choice keeps coming up. <laughs> it just shows you. And that iman is not just a matter of something you leave in the closet at home, just between you and Allah. No, no, life, all of life is about Allah. Everything in life is about Allah. Okay, I'll move on. Verse, okay, that was 26. So everyone will perish and there will remain the face of your Lord, the owner of majesty and honor. The owner of majesty and honor. Now here face, what does it mean? It refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone will perish except for Allah. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself, by saying, and there will remain the face of your Lord, the honor of majesty, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face that befits his majesty. We don't know anything about it. That's what it is, so we keep it as it is in the Quran, we believe in it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, for example, Yadullahi fawqa aidihim, that the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over or above their hands. That means Allah is supporting them. And Allah will support them. And this, it also means Allah has a hand that befits His majesty. We are not supposed to cross the red line and say, how does it look like? What kind of hand it is? Because we have no source of knowledge. That's what Allah told us. We keep it there. We're content. Our fitrah is content with that. But if someone starts saying, no, if you say hand, you are resembling Allah to His creation. This person has crossed the red line. Because they have crossed the red line, they tried to figure out what hand this is, and then they fell in trouble. Well, it must be, because your mind can't comprehend it, it must be like the hands of humans. Or that, that, that's They get into that kind of confusion, so they turn back against you and they say, no, no, you should negate the whole meaning of hand altogether. It's all a figurative meaning, there's nothing about hand, nothing about face, it's just a figurative meaning. Now, anyone who says that, they have crossed the red line. And this is why they got this wrong notion. Stay where the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were, stood, where they stood, and you'll be content. When Allah describes himself in a way in the Quran or the authentic sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ describes him, that's it. Simple as that. Because that's a perfect and intact system. If you try, start to uh, play with it, or do some changes, you will destroy that equilibrium and you will get confused. So don't play with it. Leave it as it is. Accept it as it is. That's how the companions did. And that's why they were the best. Again. So if you deny all what came before, what about that? The fact that all of you will die and Allah will not. The ever-living. 
What do you think about all of this? <coughs> so it could reach the heart of somebody who could not find any kind of, or could not relate to the points before. يسأله من في السماوات والأرض كل يوم هو في شأن. Allah takes it to uh, to another level now. Okay, Allah is the ever living. All of you die. Not only that, everything, every creature in the heavens and the earth is dependent on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They ask Him for their affairs. They either ask Him directly, or they ask Him by showing their own need. Either by their own conditions when they are in need, that's asking by their own state or their own conditions or it could be verbal they could ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means everything is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you see the whole universe is put together and it's in a state of harmony don't think it does that on its own it doesn't do that on its own and by the way the Muslims here the majority we have been influenced by that secular approach or view of the world. All the laws of physics, they don't exist by themselves. They're not self per perpetuate or oh, help me here. <laughs> huh? Yeah, they're, they're not self, they don't carry themselves. They're not there just Yeah, they're not self-derived. They're not there just like that. Even the law of gravity. Do you know what causes things to fall down? What causes things to fall down? You might say gravity. Well, that's true. But that's surface. Deeper. There are angels that pull it down. Read the in the Quran. Surah Al-Mursalat, Al-Dhariyat, al Naziat. All of these talk about different types of angels. If you think it's the wind that pushes the clouds, well, that's on the surface. Who pushes the winds and who causes the clouds to move? There are angels, that's their job. You think vegetation grows by itself, by natural law. No, 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 there are angels that push it to grow that way when, the, when there are certain conditions. That's in the Quran. It's in the Quran, but you know, we read it and we all know Surah Al Naziat, Al Mursalat, easy surahs, yeah, Dariyat, we know them. But when we come to practical reality, it doesn't even occur to us. But that's the reality. That's the reality. It's the angels that Allah placed to do different or certain jobs that cause the universe to keep running as it is now. Things don't move by themselves. The laws of physics, the laws of chemistry. Yeah, if you dig deep behind them, you'll find angels behind that. That's, a, that's why we, we really need to get back to the Qur'an and see our lives through it. There's no contradiction to science. Science are not telling you why there is rain, why there is vegetation. They're telling you how, how. And only as far as they could see and detect to a certain limit. But beyond that, they don't have the means to find out. <clears throat> so everything in the heavens and the earth is dependent on Allah and turns to Allah for their needs. <laughs> the scholars here say here, let me see the translation. He is in or bringing about a matter. Every day he is in a matter. Every day he is bringing about a matter. The real meaning here is that continuously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking after the affairs of the universe. As Imam al Qayyim says in Madarj Salikin, he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same moment he is punishing a servant and rewarding another. The deeds of, the, of his servants are being elevated to him and his decision is sent down to the earth. And he sees everyone, each and every one of his creatures in what state they are and what they are doing, what they are say, saying, what they are thinking about. Allah knows every uh, leaf when it falls and when it disintegrates 
and what happens to it and w where it ends up even the smaller atoms of it as they disperse and get separated where each one of them ends all of this is at the same time people ask are asking him all over his universe different languages different needs different requests and he is replying to all of this at the same time no one distracts his attention that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means Allah is taking care of his universe of his creatures at all times so which of the favors of Allah do you deny so you think the universe runs by itself you think you have everything you take it for granted but that's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do you still in denial <coughs> The translation reads, we will attend to you, O prominent beings. Yes, because jinn and humans were given that special ability to choose and decide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them. I would translate the, the verse a bit a slightly different. We shall allocate a time to bring you to account. The time will come, okay? when we will deal with everything you did you think you can get away with what you do the time will come uh, sometimes people try to play smart with you but you can play what a friend of mine calls the muhammad ali tactic or style is that uh, in in some uh, competitions he had he would just keep blocking 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 and until the his opponent is drained yeah out of energy then he takes him out yeah so you could do that some sometimes people play smart they think they're smart but you're observing you let them bring everything forth and then once they run out of whatever they have you can come in very powerfully and you can set things right Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow is giving something similar. Okay, you might think you get away with what you do and you're making all of these things, you're manufacturing, you're doing what, you're following your, your desires and no one is saying stop. No one is putting a limit to you. You think you get away with that. Okay, do it. Get your, what you want to do. You are the loser because you're not causing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any damage. You are just causing damage to yourself. So the time will come. No rush. The time will come. And there will the reality will show. <clears throat> Again, which of the favors of Allah do you deny? I would say here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing our fitrah. Deep inside, humans know that they are they are responsible for their actions and people even non-muslims people sometimes who don't believe in a god they still believe deep inside there's that notion that feeling inside them that if they do something they will have to pay for it it's a fitra natural disposition we know it so allah is addressing that and it's also a gift from allah so this is one of the favors of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Verse number 33 يَا مَعْشَرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ إِنْ إِسْتَطَعْتُمْ أَنْ تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَرْضِ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Verse number 33 يَا مَعْشَرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ إِنْ إِسْتَطَعْتُمْ أَنْ تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَانْفُذُوا لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِسُلْطَانِ O company of jinn and mankind if you are able to pass beyond the regions of the heavens and the earth then pass you will not pass except by authority Sometimes people say some people challenged this verse. They said, well, people have reached the moon. And some people said, no, that was all, you know, Hollywood production, etc. Regardless, we don't have means to, to verify it, yeah? But the ones who made the accusation and the ones who defended, they missed the point. Because the most correct tafsir about this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the Day of Judgment. 
because just before that he says lakum and we shall allocate a time for you or jinn and mankind so Allah now the context is started about the day of judgment and reckoning so it's not about these days but even in books of tafsir it's an authentic uh, sorry it's a it's a it's a tafsir or an explanation that is there in the books of tafsir that you cannot break from the limits of the heavens and the earth. But we can't know exactly what the verse is talking about. So this is why it's better to use the tafsir where we can relate to and make sense of things. Because we don't want to make broad statements and say, oh, you cannot get or break from the spheres around the earth. What if it happens? then it's your understanding wrong, but people would see it as if the Qur'an is wrong. So be careful. When you, something is general of the Qur'an, don't make it specific. Leave it as it is. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, on that, on that day, if you want to run away and you think you can escape, then you can't. You can't do that. Only Allah can do it. Or only with the help of Allah you can do it, and Allah is not going to let you do it. And if you try to do it, you will face يُرْسَلُ عَلَيْكُمَا شُوَاظٌ مِنَّا portions of fire and uh, molten copper liquid copper that's been melted will be thrown on you so you can't escape on that day we got hold of you on that day فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ again uh, now we move to verse number 37. And when the heaven is split open and becomes rose colored like oil. What sense do you make of this? Basically, this, the skies will be split and they will become like molten copper and lead. Like molten iron and metals. Why? Because everything will crack. And the sun will melt and will be like this molten lead, this molten lead. This is how it will be. So it will change, its own nature will change. Everything will not remain as, it, as you know it. It will take a different shape and different states. So that means, because that's going to shake you, because you don't have any grounds to stand on, everything will be different. It's a completely new world, different world. So there's nothing you can stand on, nothing stable you can stand on. There's nothing that you know. So you're completely taken out of your comfort zone and everything in, inside you, in your chest, will be exposed. يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيمَاهُمْ فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْ ذَنْبِهِ إِنْسٌ وَلَا جَانٌ فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْ ذَنْبِهِ إِنْسٌ وَلَا جَانٌ On that day, none will be asked about his sin among men or jinn. There are different tafasir about this, and all of them are correct because they look at it from a different angle. But what it means basically, there is no need to ask people about their sins. Allah will question them, but the verse means Allah is not in need to ask people of their sins so they confess because Allah has everything written and recorded. So there's no need for that. So Allah is taking now the, arg or the, the conversation to a different level. Now it's getting more serious. We're moving from this world, we're moving to the next. Now we should wake up mentioning all these details. Again, which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيمَاهُمْ فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاصِي وَالْأَقْدَامِ That's a threat. Now it reaches the point of threat. Now the criminals, the ones who did wrong, the ones who worshipped others besides Allah, the ones who denied the existence of Allah, the ones who wronged or sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be known by their marks. They will have certain signs. Their faces will be darkened. There will be shame and uh, humiliation on their faces. And they will be seized by the forelocks and the feet. They will be seized from their foreheads, seized to the fire, 
and their feet. That, what does that signify? It signifies humiliation and no concern whatsoever. So they will be seized from their feet, dragged from their feet, or their, f their foreheads. Now there's no consideration because they had no consideration in the dunya. So which of the signs or the favors of your Lord would you deny? They will be brought to the hellfire. Now, you could take this verse, which has been repeated, to that level. Now, that it will be said to them in reprimand, as they, were, as they are dragged to the hellfire, which of the favors of your Lord would you deny on that day? You see, now that's a different context. Which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? And on that day, they can't, they can't deny it. But it, no answer is, is expected from them. Because that's said in reprimand. That is said to humiliate them. That this word was said to you before, but you never, never listened to it. So they will be taken to the hellfire. This is Jahannam. You remember you were told about it, you were warned against it. Okay, and you thought it was all fairy tale. And you thought you could get away and escape now that's what you were promised here you see it with your own eyes such a profound moment for those people who will go to the hellfire profound statement and subhanallah we have similar experiences but obviously on a very basic level uh, a lot of us you know growing being young we would dream of the time i would be 20 or the time i'd become 30 uh, yeah, we always say, oh, that seems far-fetched, you know, seems, you know, it's going to take ages to get there. And how would I feel? How would I be? Or when I graduate, how does it feel? When I get married, and we have all these strange ideas. And then as soon as you get in that stage, you say, here I am. I can see it now. I used to talk about it, but now here I have arrived. SubhanAllah, that gives you some kind of, and this is why people generally, when they grow, they develop more wisdom. Because they've seen enough of these experiences. Yes, what Allah promises is going to come. Because there are things that I thought were so far-fetched and now I left them behind. I arrived there and I saw that. And it happens. So that's the nature of life. So they get to know more the nature of this life. So they are brought to the hellfire and they say, remember what you were told about, what you were warned against? Here, here it is. You see it now. It's a reality. But now, there's no going back. That's the difference, no going back. And we know the description of the hellfire in the authentic hadith where the Prophet said that the hellfire يؤتى بجهنم يوم القيامة لها سبعون ألف زمام The fire will be brought on the day of judgment. And the people of shirk, the people of sin, they look at it with fear and pain. It's brought before them. It has 70,000 handles على كل زمام سبعون ألف ملك Each handle is carried by 70,000 angels And how big is an angel? In another hadith the Prophet ﷺ says that the distance between his eye lobes and the end of his shoulder is heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Is, Another narration is 500 years 500 years for someone to walk from an angel's ear lobe to his shoulder. 70,000 would be holding each handle and Jahannam has 70,000 handles. And Allah subhanahu wa says in Surah Al-Mulk, تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ When Jahannam sees the disbelievers, it starts roaring. It's, you know, it wants to devour those ones who sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the day of judgment. That's when they will be brought to it, when, in this, in this, when they are brought face to face with this reality, we say to them, هَذِهِ جَهَنَّمْ أَلَّتِي يُكَذِّبُ بِهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ That's the one. For you it was some kind of imaginary thing, some kind of a fairy tale. Now here you see it and you shall taste it. Then it will be said to them, ذُقْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْكَرِيمُ Those you know, who had the arrogance, the arrogance when it was said to them, come to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They feel arrogant. That's religion, this religion is not for me. 
It's for those backward people back in the Middle East, back in India and Pakistan, back in Indonesia. We are civil. We don't need religion. We're humanists. We have science. We have facts. Yeah. All this arrogance or people who didn't who didn't have the humility to put their forehead on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people, it will be said to them, Dhuq innaka anta al-azizul kareem. Taste it. As they, are su- so they suffer in the hellfire. Taste it. Yes, you are the dignified, the man of honor that you claim to be. Taste it now. That's said in humiliation. So, they will be brought face to face with the hellfire. هذه جهنم التي يكذب بها المجرمون يطوفون بينها وبين حميم آن Subhanallah. Hellfire, there will be going between the hellfire and a spring of boiling water. Because out of the heat of the fire, they'll be extremely thirsty. They would ask the people of paradise. They would ask the people after a conversation. They would ask them, أَنْ أَفِيضُوا عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ أَوْ مِمَّا رَزَقُوا Please, please, just give us some water. Just a little water so that we quench our thirst in this heat. Then the people of paradise will say, Inna Allah haramahuma al kafir. Allah made that haram, forbidden for the people of the fire. Then out of thirst, they would go to this boiling water that is mixed with the pus and excretion of the people of zina, fornication. And they would drink it out of thirst and the skin of their face would fall off. And they would drink it and it would burn all their internals. That's hamim in an, boiling water. And some people think the hellfire is about heat. No. People of the hellfire get two types of torture. Extreme heat and extreme cold. Zimharir. Extreme cold. Now something you can do, get two pipes. One is warm and one is a little bit cold. Put your hand on it. Do you know this? It's known in, in the science class. They should have. They must have taught that. Get two pipes clo- close to each other. One is, I'm not saying cold, just a little bit cold, and one warm. I'm not saying hot. Put your hand on both at the same time. And if you can keep your hand for two seconds, I'll give you whatever you want. So imagine the people of the Hellfire will be given extreme cold and extreme heat, and they will be swapping, taking turns. And sometimes they will get both at the same time. So the hellfire is not only about fire and heat, it's about extreme cold, zamharir. Zamharir, you know, the Arabs say the zamharir breaks the bones. You know that, that kind of cold that hits deep in the bone? Imagine how it is in the hellfire. يَطُفُونَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ آن I will, inshallah, stop here. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّمَانَ Could be said to the people in this life as they contemplate these meanings, and it will be said to the people in the hellfire, remember, you used to deny the favors of Allah. He said it was own, our own intelligence, our own merit, our own skills, etc. Taste it now. You were given chance, you were given guidance, and your fitra was created to recognize the truth. Everything around you was directing you to Allah, but you refused. People don't go to the hellfire without being guilty. In order for people to disbelieve in Allah, they have to go out of their way against their own nature and force they, their way through disbelief, by the way. People who come in contact with the real message of Islam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about giving the comparison, the other side, people who will make it to paradise and this will be inshallah after the break. Jazakumullah khair. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد. Now the surah moves on to talk about the opposite of the people of the fire, the people. ولمن خاف مقام ربه جنتان. And for those who have feared, or for he who has feared the position of his Lord, are two gardens. This talks about the highest level in Jannah, the best of people, as sabiqun These are as sabiqun which were referred to in Surah Al-Waqi'ah. وَالسَّابِقُونَ sabiqun السَّابِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ These are as sabiqun the ones who have secured the highest positions. 
They're the ones who hasten to the worship of Allah. They are also al-muqarrabun, the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are described in Surah Al-Waqi'ah as thullatun min al awwaleen It's like a big group from the early generations. Wa qaleelun min al akhirin And a limited number from among the later generations. Limited number. These are al-muqarrabun, the highest levels of paradise. The second level will be the general Muslims who will enter paradise. Now, in the high, on the highest level, muqarrabun, they get the best. And they have two gardens for them. How do we know that they are muqarrabun? Because of the description of these two gardens. And because... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَا قَامَ رَبِّهِ for, the, for that person who has feared the high standing of, stand, or the high position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means they were aware of Allah they were mindful of Allah and that's the description of Ihsan so these are the people who have reached Ihsan there's another region that we will come to towards the end of that description so for those people there will be two gardens the scholars say, why two gardens? One, they will be given because they have fulfilled their obligations. The second one, they will be given because they have refrained from sin. Two gardens. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Can you give me the Arabic? Can you give me Arabic Mus'haf? I'm, re I'm reading from the English and translating into Arabic again and again. Difficult. Jazakallah khair. It's okay. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ ذَوَاتَا أَفْنَانِ Having spreading branches. Okay, they have branches, these two gardens. Here it describes them as uh, spread or spreading branches. But these are the best of branches, full of fruits, full of greenery, and full of shade. They give about shade. They form a canopy. They create a certain atmosphere for these people. Okay, so it's a whole thing about branches. Every, the best of any description that could relate to bra these branches, spreading branches, applies to these uh, to these two uh, gardens. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ فِيهِمَا عَيْنَانِ تَجْرِيَانِ So which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? فِيهِمَا عَيْنَانِ تَجْرِيَانِ And both of them are two springs. Flowing. Two springs flowing. This is the best of water, the water of paradise. The water of paradise, the springs of paradise, the sweetest of water. Something no eye has seen, no, no ear has ever heard of, and no one can even think about. Something phenomenal that is given to these people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes these two, and the best book on the description of paradise is the description given by Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim has a book on describing, uh, a complete book on describing paradise. Uh, what is the name of the book? Inshallah, come back. But he has a full book on describing paradise. Everything in paradise. He describes the air, uh, the trees, the mud, the dirt, the rivers, the uh, wives of the people of paradise. Everything describes them in extreme detail. Now, the majority of the hadith in that book are authentic. But there is a number of weak hadith still there. But it's been verified. The book has been verified. 
So this is what I would recommend. I think it must have been translated into English. And there's a couple of poems as well. Some brothers put in English, beautiful descriptions. Somebody told me about them and I just heard some bits of them. They're really, they're quite good, mashallah. فيهما عينان تجريان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فيهما من كل فاكهة زوجان. In them, there are in both of them there are of every fruit two kinds. So every type of fruit you will find it there, but there will be two kinds of each fruit, and each one is different. Each one is different. This surah was revealed in Mecca. Was revealed in Mecca before Hijrah. Was revealed in Mecca before Hijrah, and this is basically to put the main context here for this is the comparison between the people of the Hellfire and the people of Paradise. Now you will notice that this description of Paradise or what awaits the people of Paradise is detailed. Allah is describing the branches, describing the water, the springs, and describes even their state, how they sit and how they recline, and describes a description of their uh, wives there, etc. But the description of the hellfire, or the people of the fire was short, just two or three verses. What is the point behind this? What is the reason? You have a short description of the people of the fire, by the people of paradise, Allah even describes both levels and describes each level in fair detail. Why is this? Targhib. Hmm? to yeah, motivate people towards the paradise. Okay, what else? Excellent. The surah is Surat Ar-Rahman. It's mercy. So if, it's Allah, if Allah is going to talk about punishment, okay, He's going to just allude to it, mention it briefly. But because the context is mercy, he will elaborate on mercy more. Is that clear? You see how the general frame of the surah impacts everything in it. فيهما من كل فاكهة زوجان فبأي لا يربكما تكذبان متكئين على فرش بطائنها من استبرق وجن الجنتين دان. Allah describes their state in paradise. They are reclining on beds whose linings are of silk brocade. And the fruit of the two gardens is hanging low. That's, it's not an accurate translation because متكين على فرش بطائنها من استبرق They are reclining on beds whose بطائن is the lower part of it which you, is the lining which you place on the, on the floor which is usually hard, usually hard. It's the hardest part of a, uh, a recliner or a chair or a bed is the bottom of it because the softness you need it in top. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying even the bottom of it is made of the finest of silk. So what do you think of the top? Something beyond that. That's just to honor them. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Again, try to work out that context for yourself. وَجَنَ الْجَنَّتَيْنِ دَانِ And the fruits of this garden are very close to them. So they don't have to stand up and grab them. They just extend their hand a little bit and they get whatever they want. So extreme comfort. Extreme comfort. In some hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentions that even one of them, for example, wishes for some kind of chicken, grilled chicken. Okay? It would straight away come to him. Grilled. That's it. You just wish and it becomes true. That's what happens to the people, especially this level, al-sabiqoon, al-muqarrabun, the highest level in paradise. So even the fruit, they don't have to stand up and go and get it. They don't have to exert that effort to go and fetch it. It's close to them, as long as they, they just grab it and eat it. That's how much comfort Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. Even the description, they're not lying on their backs or their sides. They're not standing. They're just basically reclining like kings in luxury, extreme luxury. 
وجن الجنتين دان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فيهن قاصرات الطرف لم يطمثهن إنس قبلهم ولا جان Okay, in them are women limiting their glances. That means these women don't look at men. This woman is only for her husband. That's it. He is her world. She's exclusively for him. She doesn't look at anything else, at anyone else. She doesn't develop any feelings towards anyone. She's purely for him. He is her world and her passion, her emotions and her love. Before them, untouched before them by men or jinn. So no one has seen these women. No one has come near them. They're just created for you. There. And subhanAllah, this is something men love. Men you know, are possessive when it comes to their family, to their wife, protective. They, this thing is in line with the nature of humans, the fitrah of men. They love to have this kind of protective attitude. They want, that's my wife. That's my wife. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to them because these people have sound fitrah in the first place. It's not corrupt. Because when someone's fitrah is corrupt, they don't mind who's with their wife. So it's an, a sign of a sound fitrah. When the man is protective of their spouse, of their wife, that's a sign of a sound fitrah. The more protective they are, the more sound their fitrah is. And this is why the people in paradise, by the way, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim talks about people who enter paradise. He says, no one will enter paradise except after having been purified from every impurity. So they enter paradise in the best fitrah, the best state of human being. And if someone is not purified, they will be either purified by the pain they get in the grave or the pain they get on the day of judgment and the heat and the, and the, and the long wait. Or they get that with, when they stand before Allah for questioning. So they get purified of this. If they reach all these levels and they have not been purified, out of mercy for them, they will be sent to the hellfire. So they get purified, so they qualify to enter paradise. So it's not just, okay, you go to paradise, you go to the hellfire. No, you have to meet the conditions. You have to meet these conditions. You have to be purified. So into paradise, you are pure. Again, the same question. Then Allah describes them again. As if they were rubies and coral, like diamonds. These women, these wives are just like diamonds. Precious, pure, attractive. Maybe this description sometimes may not apply to all cultures. But in the Arab culture, when you, talk, when you want to describe something that it's the finest of its kind, you say it's yaqut. It's, it's, it's a diamond. That's what it is, the finest of its kind. It, it's got the best attributes, the best traits of its kind. And all of this is to... Uh, reassure the believers as to what awaits them. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Is the... Let me see how he translates. Is the reward for good anything but good? Is the reward for إِحْسَان anything but إِحْسَان? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِحْسَان is the... We said the apex of worship. To worship Allah purely as if you see Him. So you will get reward of the same kind. You get reward of the same kind. And surprisingly, or the beautiful thing here is that the ihsan of humans is human. So it has the shortcomings of the human. So this is, Allah is saying, is the reward of ihsan, which these people did, okay, perfection in terms of worship, the best of worship that they did, okay, is it anything but al ihsan? But the second ihsan is from Allah. So our ihsan has our, sh our qualities, shortcomings, weaknesses. But that ihsan is from Allah. So there's no shortcomings. There are no gaps in it. There are no faults. The best. That's ihsan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hal jaza'u al-ihsani 
إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ This is why we said the people who will get there, these are the people who have reached the level of Al-Ihsan. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the lower level of heaven. That's for the general Muslims who enter paradise. وَمِن دُونِهِمَا جَنَّتَانِ And below them both, in excellence, are two other gardens. Again, the general Muslims will get two gardens as well. One for fulfilling the obligations and the second one is for abstaining from sin. That's it. وَمِن دُونِهِمَا جَنَّتَانِ مُدْهَامَّتَانِ Dark green in color. That means they, they are nurtured, these gardens. They get enough watering and enough nutrition that the, the greenery there is very intense. It's very intense and very attractive. So they are well taken care of. Mudhammatan. Subhanallah, the green color is soothing to the eye and the soul. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانْ فِيهِمَا عَيْنَانِ نَضَّاخَتَانِ In both of them are two springs spouting. That means a gushing forth. Water is coming out with force and power out of these two springs. It's a similar thing. But obviously now the first two gardens are for the people of As-Sabiqoon. Everything is better there. Now, you get this, it's obviously excellent quality, but still doesn't reach that level. It doesn't reach that level, but it's so great. And In both of them are fruit and palm trees and pomegranates. You see the difference there? Of every fruit, there are two kinds. But here, what is highlighted is three types. That shows, obviously there are others, but there's a difference in level. There's a difference in level, but that's still great. If we just make it to paradise, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> In them are good and beautiful women in these gardens. These are the wives of the people of paradise. Good and beautiful women. That means women in the best shape and of the utmost beauty. But obviously not the beauty of the women on the higher garden. Fair ones reserved in Pavilions, in these pavilions, great tents. They're, they're described as tents, but they are palaces. These women are preserved there, so they don't go out, go out and mix with others. So they are exclusive, again, ex exclusive to their husband. All of this reassures, as I said again, the believer reassures him. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانْ لَمْ يَطْمِثْهُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَانْ Untouched before them by man or jinn. They're not touched before. They are created for you specifically. No one has ever touched them and no one will touch them apart from you. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانْ مُتَّكِئِينَ عَلَى رَفْرَفٍ خُضْرٍ وَعَبْقَرِيٍ حِسَانٍ Reclining on green cushions and beautiful fine carpets. You see the difference in the description? Those ones are on luxurious beds made of the finest type of silk. And this is still luxurious but not to the same level. Recli reclining on green cushions. Abqariyan uh, in the Arabic language is the best type of texture. It's more like silk. So these people get the finest of everything. And they are again reclining to signify that they are living in luxury, ease and tranquility. Just as Allah says, 
uh, in Surah Al-Mutafifin, تَعْرِفُ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ نَضْرَةَ النَّعِيمُ When you look at the faces of the people of paradise, you can recognize the brightness of luxury and a life of ease. You can see it, it reflects on their faces. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانْ تَبَارَكَ اسْمُ رَبِّكَ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Blessed is the name of your Lord, honor of majesty and honor. That's the last verse. So it started with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it ends with Allah. To tell you the story of life is all about Allah. The story of life is all about Allah. And you need to put together Allah's mercy because sometimes people might take it wrong. Just as with some religions, they only say Allah merciful, but they don't look at the other side. So this is why they have no problem sinning against Allah. But there's a balance. Another religion looks at the anger of Allah, pays attention to the, more to the anger of Allah, forgets about the mercy of Allah. With Islam, there's, we said there's that balance. You need to know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put them together because they function together. Tabarak asma, glorified be the name of your Lord. The owner of majesty and honor. So along with that mercy, there's, don't think there is weakness. No, there is majesty and honor. Okay, so always you need to put the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. So he is merciful with about, and his mercy shows in everything he mentioned in the surah, everything he gave you and how events will go, this dunya, al-akhirah, next life and how people end up in the hellfire and some people end, end up in paradise with all the blessings Allah has given. All of this is the mercy of Allah. And some people might have the notion that if He's merciful, but how is He going to get all of this thing? Allah is the one who owns majesty and power. So He can make this, these things happen. So mercy does not signify weakness. It is there with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So this is generally the meaning. Something about Paradise. There was a, a program uh, here in the UK, the big questions, something like that, and they were talking about paradise. And there was a brother on that show, and that was a big mistake, very big mistake, because you can't talk about paradise without putting it in the right context. You need to agree uh, just as we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always has a starting point when he builds an argument. Once you agree on this, he takes you to the next level. But you can't jump to the 10th level without having established anything before. So you go to, you sit among non-Muslims of, of all religions or denominations and atheists, people who don't believe even in God or heaven and earth. And you talk to them about the wine that will be served to the people in paradise and the women. That's out of context. So you give the wrong message. You give the wrong message. So this is why if you are going to talk about these things or if you are going to appear on these shows, it has, you make sure that you might say something true, but and this is something very beneficial as well. The scholars say in order to say the right thing, you need to have two qualities or two things, two conditions. You have to say something true and you have to have what we call al-adl, which is the balance. You have, it has, the conditions have to be ready for that. For example, I can tell you, for example, uh, what did you do yesterday? You might tell me, oh, it's raining outside. What you said is true, but it's not appropriate. There's no adil, there's no balance there. So you might say the true thing, but you don't say it in the right context and you don't say it appropriately. So you get the wrong results. So it's not enough to say the truth, but you have to put it in the right context, in the right way, at the right time. Because if you say something true at the wrong time, you'll get pain. You have to say the right thing at the right time. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal the Quran altogether. He sent it down in segments in order to cultivate people and get them ready for that level. So you walk into that studio and you appear on TV and suddenly you're talking to people and they just laugh, laugh at you. And they don't laugh at you as a person, they laugh at Islam. 
I don't doubt the, the definitely the, the intention, good intention of the brothers who try to help in that. But we need to be careful. You might say something true and get the wrong message across because you had haq, true, truth, but you didn't have adl, the balance, appropriateness. You didn't have it. So in order to say something, you need to say the truth and it has to be appropriate. The conditions have to be right. It has to be the right time for it. This is why sometimes you might see people who try to uh, sometimes uh, defend the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say something true, but it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. So they bring about a lot of damage. One example, a very famous example, was Ibn Taymiyyah was with some of his students. And I mentioned this to some brothers they, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, there were the Mughals when they came to Damascus. They claimed to be Muslims. And they were making adhan and salah and everything. They were just like a Muslim state. But they used to kill Muslims, even sometimes for fun. So they were in Damascus. Ibn Taymiyyah was with a group of his students. One of them saw these uh, soldiers drinking alcohol. So he rushed to go and give them advice. You're Muslims, that's haram, you shouldn't be. He thought it was true. It is true. Ibn Taymiyyah saw him, he grabbed him, he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to give them advice. Enjoying the good, forbid the evil. Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi al munkar. Yeah? He said, no, don't do that. Because these people, when they're drunk, they keep to themselves, they're busy. But if they wake up, they start killing Muslims. So it is dearer to Allah. That's what he said. The fact that they are drunk is dearer to Allah than they, than they are conscious. You see where? Truth and appropriateness. This is why you see, you see a lot of some obviously uh, well-known names. They appear on TV. We will establish Islam. We will establish Sharia. That's not the way of the Prophet And of, uh, Wallahu alam, this is all you know, a game being played and put together. So, say the truth, but that's not enough. Be sure that that's the right time for it. It is said in the right manner, in the right context, to the right person. Al-Mizan. Yeah, justice, balance, you need to get that. Otherwise, you'll be causing damage. So, not enough, oh, what I'm... A lot of people argue, well, is, isn't it true? Am I saying something wrong? No, it's true, but it's not the right place for it. So it brings about damage. So you say haq and adl. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. He describes in the Quran. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ سُورَةِ الْأَنَّامِ وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا And the word of your Lord has been completed and perfected in truth and injustice has to have these two conditions okay so these are just reflections don't forget that everything there has to do with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and needs to be put in its right context that Allah is the omnipotent the all-powerful